Hello. Today we're going to talk about happiness and how we can pursue it differently than we usually do. As Americans, we are fascinated by happiness. Look at all of the books that I retrieved by simply Googling books about happiness. These are just some of the titles that I found. They speak for themselves. Resisting Happiness, The Happiness Project, Happiness Challenge, Happiness Hypothesis. We are all fascinated by, by the idea that we can pursue our own happiness. And in fact, the words happiness are written into the founding documents of this country. Here are the founders, they're signing the Declaration of Independence, and I'll bet that every single one of you in this room knows the words that I'm about to say to you, that we have the right to life, to liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These are some of the best known and best loved words in American history. But what I'm going to tell you today is actually that they are some of the most misunderstood words in American history. Now, when people think about historians and what we do, they often ask me, you know, why do you want to be a historian? You're just looking at the stuff that people did a long time ago, and we're kind of living in the now when we're going <laughs> off into the future. So what on earth does the past have to do with what we are up to today? And what I tell them is that historians are like anthropologists. We are listening to the people who are no longer here with us, who want to tell us things, things that can be useful to us today. Many of those people left no record of their lives. Many of them left just a tissue of words, words that it is really difficult for us to recover today. You go back in time 10 years, it's already starting to get a little fuzzy. 20 years, there were no iPhones. 40 years, we didn't have desktop computers. Try going back 300 years, where I spend my days in the 18th century. And you can imagine that the level of misunderstanding for what people said <coughs> begins to ratchet up. So what did people mean in the 18th century by happiness? They meant public happiness. So we have totally lost this concept today. What on earth did they mean by public happiness? What they meant by public happiness was every citizen thinking of the larger good, thinking of society, and thinking about the structures of government that would create a society that was peaceful and that would allow as many people as possible to flourish. What they thought was that only public happiness would create the umbrella of stability and security under which we could pursue private happiness. So they also had a concept of private happiness, like those wonderful books that I showed you at the beginning of my talk today. But they saw that private happiness was only to be achieved after we had achieved public happiness. So public happiness was this great and beautiful umbrella that could be created when all of us work together as citizens to create a society and a good government. It's often most useful to think of concepts by their opposites. So the opposite of private happiness is sadness. The opposite of public happiness is something much worse. It's tyranny or anarchy. Why did they have this concept? Well, let me take you back to 1776. <laughs> we have been magically transported. On the left is my attempt to create a circle around the 13 colonies with my mouse. Those are the 13 US colonies in a crucible of crisis at the moment where they are rebelling against the largest empire that the world has ever seen. That is the British Empire, and they, in a very foolhardy way, decided that 13 colonies with basically no army and no navy and no tradition of working together could fight a war against the most powerful <coughs> empire the world had ever seen. This is the concept in which they developed the idea of public happiness. This was going to be the great shield under which they would build the first modern republic that lasted because many republics had not lasted. 
What did they fear? Well, they feared enemies on the outside. Those would be the British, also potentially the French, the Spanish, a lot of other people who didn't exactly wish the Americans well. They feared anarchy within. Remember, one in every five people at this time was enslaved. What better opportunity than rebellion to have another rebellion from within, a slave rebellion? They feared tyranny. They feared the return of a king who was taxing them without representation, which they believed to be the worst kind of political tyranny. And finally, they saw very keenly the vulnerability of democracy, that institutions of government that are created by the people and for the people are inherently subject to the failures of being human beings. It is difficult to uphold a democracy. It is something that must be renewed every day. So it was within this context that they called on every citizen to think of the public happiness. Don't take it from me, take it from them. We're gonna spend a little bit of time with people whose voices we can recapture today. This is Abigail Adams. This is her handwriting. She's writing public happiness. This is a woman who did not have the vote. Women wouldn't get the vote until the 20th century, but she, in her own, own handwriting, just in a random letter, is thinking about public happiness. There is no um, standardized spelling in the 18th century, so she spells it with a K, so she's not misspelling it. There's, there's actually no way to misspell anything in the 18th century. It's great. <laughs> Here's George Washington. There is nothing which can better deserve your patronage than the promotion of science and literature. <coughs> Knowledge is in every country the surest basis of public happiness. We are standing at Stanford University. This is a monument to the idea of public happiness, that if you educate young people, they will become good citizens and they will know how to uphold democracy. Here's John Adams. The judiciary, pulling out one of the three branches of government, the judiciary system of the United States, no subject is more interesting than this to the public happiness. So the idea of an independent judiciary, free from influence from the other branches of government, was extremely important to John Adams. Here's Thomas Jefferson. The zeal and wisdom of our legislators, another branch of government, who lay the foundations of public happiness in wholesome laws. So he's pulling out the second branch of government as this umbrella of public happiness. Here's somebody who doesn't have immediate face recognition, but I know you know him. Uh, this is Noah Webster. You know him as the great lexicographer, the guy who wrote Webster's dictionary full of new American words like skunk and canoe that had entered in the English language in the 18th century. But he was also a great abolitionist, fighting against the great scourge of the 18th and 19th centuries, which was the bondage of millions of Africans in the United States. Slavery, he said, impedes the public happiness. This, of course, would be resolved in the aftermath of the Civil War that freed four million slaves. It was all over the press, the idea of public happiness, not just in private letters. It is very dangerous for a nation to have its public happiness depend on the virtues and vices of a single man. So here we're pulling out the final branch of government. It's like they're talking to us, you know? The <laughs> final branch of government, the executive branch, how it is so important to shield that branch from the virtues and vices of a single man. And then finally, the document that they set up to make sure that the public happiness would, would be maintained into the future to guard our free and happy constitution against every machination and danger and to make it the best source of public happiness, they said, just after the constitution was ratified. You know, democracy is fragile. We must renew it every day. What is so wonderful about listening to the 18th century and being historian anthropologists is that we don't know when the moment of national crisis is. We don't know when the emergency will come. But what those voices from the 18th century tell us is that there is some 
thing waiting there for us, an idea that we can use today, the idea of public happiness as the great shield under which we can defend our democratic institutions. Thank you.